Realm presents Silverwood, Episode 6. Devin smirked as he adjusted his night vision goggles. Hidden under the face mask, no one would even know about his little clever man's advantage. Clever person's advantage, he corrected himself. It wouldn't do to go normalizing androcentric language and minimizing the important contributions of women to world history and culture. Not even in his head. Speaking of women, why wasn't Amber back yet? He had put her on his team for a reason. Athletic and svelte, he knew she would be a valuable partner. She could go the distance. Much like, naturally, any other woman. Though in Amber's case, he knew from personal experience. A cigarette exploded into existence, amplified to the appearance of a nuclear bomb going off by the green filter of his night vision goggles. Really, in night vision, everything was just green splotches. He toggled them off and squinted in the absurdly low moonlight. The cherry of the cigarette was still bobbing in the moonlight, though it no longer had the look of a mushroom cloud going off. He was pretty sure that Earl, the manager from shipping and receiving, had lit the cigarette. They were on the same team. Earl. Earl swiveled on a dime and fired his paintball gun from the hip as he did so, painting a bright pink neon splash on Devin's face mask. The other man's instincts were apparently razor sharp. Devin never went down to the docks if he could avoid it, so he had never really had a conversation with Earl but now he suspected the other man was a veteran. Oh, shit. The cigarette bobbed up and down in time with Earl's mouth. Didn't realize it was you, Mr. Fisher. I guess you're out. Devin removed his face mask, surreptitiously taking the night vision goggles with it so Earl wouldn't see his little accoutrement. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a towel he just so happened to have brought with him, totally unrelated to the game in any way, naturally, and began furiously polishing the paint and pollen from his mask. No, that's all right, Earl. Honest mistake. We'll just call it even and not mention to anyone, hmm? If he didn't know better, he would have thought Earl had just rolled his eyes at him, though it had come off as little more than an owl's eyes shimmering in the bare moonlight. Never got any take-backs on friendly fire in Afghanistan, Earl muttered. Sorry, what was that, Earl? Devin said, pretending to still be concentrating on his face mask, though he had heard every word. His hearing was flawless, like his eyesight, physique, and moral rectitude. I said, uh, you better get your mask back on there, Mr. Fisher. Remember, uh, your rules about never taking them off? Call me Devin, please, he said, though frankly, some barely contained minuscule iota of as yet unresocial engineered speck of masculine machismo somewhere deep inside, thrilled a little bit at being treated with such deference. As he fitted the mask back on, he asked the question he'd really wanted to ask all along. Do you know where Amber is? Amber, Earl repeated, furrowing his brow. I don't know a lot of people outside of the docks. What does she look like? Devin cleared his throat. A sneeze struck him. His hay fever had been acting up ever since they'd arrived. Well, um, she's, uh, very fit, a trim, a bit slender. Earl's eyes lit up. Oh, yeah, the blonde? I know you mean. She's a real looker, that lady. If I were a couple years younger, you know? He blew a puff of air from between his lips. It took everything in Devon not to smile knowingly, nod, and admit that he had been slamming that hot piece of ass, that looker, rather, no, that attractive young lady, for the better part of six months. Well, uh, workplace romances, uh, you know, Earl. Don't want to get caught up in a sexual harassment complaint or anything. Besides, I think our female co-workers deserve a little more respect than that, don't you? We're not on the docks right now, you know. Earl's face turned cold. But the important thing was that Devin had put the lowly box monkey back in his place. Nope, that wasn't it. The important thing was that he had defended Amber's honor. No, 
A woman could defend her own honor. She didn't need a man swooping in like a white knight. Devin shook his head, trying to clear it. His thoughts were all a jumble. It was like he couldn't quite piece together the right two words. Earl, though, seemed to be under no such limitations. He sneezed and then spoke. Hey, Mr. Fisher, Devin... Did I ever tell you that you were a laughing stock no one respects and you can eat my ass? Devin paused. The fuck did you just say to me? He shook his head. My apologies, Earl. I meant to say I respect your candor and wish to solicit further opinions. But are you familiar with the concept of a compliment sandwich? If you have something negative to say, you should sandwich it between two compliments. Earl nodded and dropped to his knees to grab something off the ground. I'm sorry. What I meant to say was... Earl jammed a pine cone into Devin's forehead and rubbed his hand back and forth until it disintegrated. Devin nodded in acceptance. He knelt to grab something himself. That's good he said, rising back to his feet. But I'm not quite sure you get the concept. Let me show you how the compliment sandwich works. Pretend your head is the ugly, disgusting, pisshead, dock monkey, nasty piece of shit you really want to say. Now, pretend these rocks are two compliments. Devon clapped the stones simultaneously to the sides of Earl's head like a pair of cymbals. Earl crumpled instantly, bleeding from both temples. He was likely going to die, and Devin felt weirdly okay with that. He could probably pin the apparent murder on poor safety decisions on Earl's part. He would be surprised if Earl was even up to date on all of his training certificates. If a single one was out of compliance, Devin would be off the hook. He could turn the headline in the Hirsch Capital newsletter from CFO Devin Fisher plans deadly retreat to... Earl, whatever his last name is, was a piece of shit. It never occurred to him to actually help Earl. He did, however, consider whether he should attempt to smother Earl and ensure that he didn't recover and finger Devin as his killer. He checked his pockets for the towel he had brought to clean paint, rather, that he had brought to... for no special reason... The voice didn't so much speak as slither, creeping out of the darkness like a foul breeze. Devin glanced around and then jumped, hearing a whisper above him. He slipped behind a tree. Had somebody been watching? Was there a witness? Did he have to bring someone else down now? Devin spotted Carlos from the travel desk perched on a bough above his head. His thick salt and pepper beard was impossible to miss. Luckily, he wasn't looking in Devin's direction. Instead, he was focused on Rosanna, the secretary from the contracting office, who stood in a glade nearby. Carlos had apparently brought a real gun with him, a handgun of some sort, which almost alarmed Devin enough to want to yell at him about safety, but Devin had the presence of mind, such as it was, not to show his ass like that. Carlos was whispering to himself, practically muttering, Come on, show the tank. Devin furrowed his brow and glanced at Rosanna. Was Carlos homicidal now? Was this a new thing? But if so, why didn't he just shoot her? Chewing and loudly popping her ubiquitous wad of bubblegum, she wasn't even trying to hide. Carlos kept muttering to himself, as if anxious for Rosanna to do something. All she was doing was standing there, scratching her nose, glancing around. Finally, almost out of boredom, she shifted her paintball gun from her right shoulder to her left, so that it was in Carlos's and Devin's line of sight. Smile, you son of a bitch. A shot rang out, and Devin was almost surprised at how long it seemed to take before the gas tank on Rosanna's paintball gun exploded. Rosanna's torso disappeared like a balloon filled with red paint, popping. Her legs and hips stood for a moment before toppling over. But Carlos had given away his position. Hey, that asshole's on Squad A, someone shouted. 
Get him. Carlos tried to turn and shoot at some people, but a volley of paintballs from higher on the hill slammed into him, sending him toppling from the tree. Devin shuddered as Carlos smashed face first into the ground. His neck snapped and his head twisted all the way around. Things were getting kind of violent around here. Devin put his finger to his lips. His eyes itched, and he desperately wanted to remove the goggles and rub them. He seemed likely to get in big trouble for putting together this event now. Earl dead was one thing, but now Carlos and Rosanna, and who all knew who else was completely different. I should probably head back and straighten this all out. He leaned down to grab Carlos's gun, but something wet and hot splashed over his back, like he had just been caught unawares by the wave machine at a water park. He reached up and patted his head. His fingers came away red. Now his whole back was probably covered with blood. He whirled around. Sherry, from accounts receivable, was as slick with blood as Devin was. With her long press-on nails, she was having trouble yanking out the trachea of the spread eagle director of accounts payable. What? she said. They're always fucking things up for us. Devin folded his arms and gave her his best corporate hatchet man stare. She turned and ran. Sherry, he called after her. We're going to need to have a telecon about this. He staggered after her, decided, fuck it, and waved her off. An explosion detonated somewhere in the distance. A band of mailroom personnel with shit daubed under their eyes like war paint darted by carrying an accountant skewered like a pig on a long stick. A couple of lab coats nearby had formed a circle and were shooting each other repeatedly in the eyes. The whole forest was going to heck in a handbasket. This is not how team building is supposed to work, Devin hollered at the top of his lungs. Something hard slammed into Emilio's hip. He winced and doubled over in pain. Despite his being packed in thick layers of clothes, that had still hurt. It probably hadn't been a paintball at all. He looked down and cupped his wound. Pulling up his sweatshirt, he saw a terrible bruise, and his fingers came away bloody. Son of a... Another projectile whizzed past his face, missing it by mere inches. That's not a paintball, he realized. That's a fucking rock. Clenching his fists in anger and still wincing from the pain, Emilio pulled off his face mask and rose to his full height. All right, he shouted. Who's the joker taking pot shots with goddamn rocks? Hey, someone shouted. It's one of those squad beef fucks. Get him! Came another voice he recognized from around the office but couldn't explicitly place. Uh, Emilio said, realizing that this was not normal paintball player behavior. Two men in red vests were running toward him. These fuckers looked like they were out for blood. One fired his paintball gun again, and another rock glanced off Emilio's ear. Fuck! Emilio paused, wondering whether he should stand his ground. This was just a game, wasn't it? And an asinine one at that, considering it was Devin Fisher's idea. The screaming, primal, ape-like, pollen-dusted faces of the men running toward him did not indicate that they thought of it as just a game. What was he supposed to do? Ask for a timeout? Look for Devin or something? Call the cops? It had been a while since he'd felt this out of control of his own life. Deborah, an older woman whose job he was completely spacing on, came running, screaming at him. He jumped out of the way. Her face was covered with pollen, welts, and blossoming bruises. Fifteen feet, she shouted. No shot closer than fifteen feet. Why won't anyone follow the rules? She turned and jammed her paintball gun under the face mask of one of the Red Vest team members and fired over and over again. The man shuddered at each shot, and Emilio hissed in sympathy. Even from a distance, paintballs could sting. From that close, he was probably blind, and possibly his face was mashed to a pulp. The other red vest fired some rocks at Deborah, felling her. Whether dead or hurt, Amelia wasn't sure. While they were distracted, 
Emilio turned and fled, pursued by the sounds of shouting men and rocks pulverizing tree limbs. He grunted as an errant branch slapped him. A black puff of powder went off in his face. He wrinkled his nose at the sickly sweet smell and closed his watering eyes, bawling his fists. He sneezed, and his thoughts clouded. Anger coursed through him. No, running wasn't the right answer. He'd been running all his life. Now was the time to turn and face the demons of his past and... Yeah. Oh, shit. Startled by the voice, he'd lost control, and his legs slid across a patch of slick leaves, and he went sliding down an incline. He didn't come to a stop until he tumbled with a loud splash into a freezing stream. His butt was submerged in cold mud, but the stream was shallow enough that the rest of him was still relatively dry. He heard a splash and whirled around. A figure stood in the middle of the stream, dripping wet, a paintball gun across his body. It was hard to tell in the weak light, but Emilio was pretty sure he was wearing a blue vest, the same as he was. But what difference did that make? At this point, they were way past the whole reds versus blues dynamic. This was a battle for survival. And Emilio would be damned if he was going to die out in the woods like this. He threw himself toward the figure, swinging the butt of his paintball gun like a club. Rough hands snatched it from his grip before a beefy forearm wrapped itself around his neck and easily disarmed him, both metaphorically and physically. No, Emilio grunted. Let me go. The figure slowly but methodically lowered him down into the stream and shoved his face under. Emilio panicked, his arms and legs flailing as he began to drown. The other man let his face up, so he took a deep breath and lashed out, trying to get his hands around his attacker, but then he was thrust back under. His second time under the drink, he started to let himself go. This was probably it. The third time, he just relaxed and allowed it to happen. If this was how he was going to die, so be it. But then the figure let him up. Are you okay? Emilio looked up into the expressionless mask. The figure slowly removed it, revealing Jeremy's beatific face. Emilio was shivering. Jeremy grabbed him and helped him to his feet and across to the other bank. His teeth chattered. What? What are you trying to do? Kill me? Baptize me? Jeremy snorted. He pulled Emilio into a tight embrace, trying to warm him with body heat. Emilio succumbed to it. You know I don't believe in any of that stuff, and I would never hurt you. He stroked Emilio's hair lightly. Then what? I heard something weird, Jeremy said. Like the trees were talking to me. Everybody's acting crazy. A couple of primal hoots sounded from the woods nearby. Jeremy grabbed Emilio and hurried him away to a patch of low ferns where they could crouch, more or less hidden. Emilio was quickly shivering again, and Jeremy pulled him in close once more. Case in point, Jeremy said. I saw Deborah blast paintballs in a guy's face, and I saw another guy shoot her with rocks. A dark pall came over Jeremy. That's not the worst of it. People are killing each other. Friends, co-workers, it's bad. I could have killed someone too, and not out of self-defense. I really just wanted to do it. But I fell into that stream. When I came out, I realized I hadn't been thinking properly. It's like there's something dark and deadly in the air, or... Pollen, Emilio said. I got hit in the face with a branch, and it made me nuts. Jeremy paused and pursed his lips. Maybe. So, the water washes it clean or something? Jeremy shrugged. I don't know. Maybe it's just a shock of coldness. Or maybe it counteracts... Look, I didn't go to college like you, Emilio. I'm just a dock monkey. I don't know why it works, I just know it does. Emilio put his hand on his boyfriend's cheek. You're not just a dock monkey. 
and you're not dumb. I don't care where you went to school or didn't. I do love these big muscles of yours, though. He rubbed Jeremy's bicep. Why? Because I can hold you underwater with them? I didn't know you were into breath play. We might have something new to try. They both clammed up as someone loud clomped through the foliage nearby. She wore a blue vest and whistled an impressive imitation of a whippoorwill. Jeremy held his fingers to his lips and tensed in preparation for attacking the blue vest as she passed. Amelia ran his hand across his forehead. He wasn't used to physical activity like this. He worked at a desk all day. One of the things he had found so sexy about Jeremy was his ability to act decisively and boldly in times of physical danger. In a weird way, Emilio was disappointed when the blue vest passed on and Jeremy never had to spring into action. But then he worried that maybe those weren't even his real thoughts. Maybe the pollen was creeping back into his senses again. It was so hard to even keep his thoughts straight. Jeremy grabbed his hands. Let's get out of here, Emilio. He nodded. Yes. We need to get to the highway and get out of here. Call the cops or something. No, I don't mean just this. All this death has made me realize we're not really living, you and I. I'm tired of hiding a relationship. I'm tired of pretending I'm not with you every time I see you at work. How often do you see me at work, Jeremy? You work on the loading dock, and I... He swallowed his last few words. It doesn't matter how often, Jeremy said, ignoring the unkindness that might have been about to come from Emilio's mouth. Once is too often. Normal people can see each other in the hallway and kiss on the cheek, or... I mean, we don't have to give each other blowjobs in the janitor's closet. I just want to be out and open. I don't want to have to hide anymore. Jeremy, we're in a life and death situation right now. Is this really the time? I'm talking about our life. I'm talking about feeling like I'm dead inside every day. What are we clinging to? Let's be real. Hirsch Capital won't keep existing after this, whatever this is. The PR will be absolute murder for the whole company. So what are we clinging to? Let's get out of here, man. Let's run. Let's go move across the country and get away from your stuck-in-the-fifties family and live somewhere together like a real couple. I'm tired of feeling like your mistress. You're not my mistress, Jeremy. But we live in the real world. We can't just drop our lives and move across the country. Then another country. Mexico or France or... I don't know. Emilio ran his hand across Jeremy's face. Let's just get safe and talk about this later. Jeremy nodded, but the heartbreak on his face was obvious. Later. Sure. Taylor hissed as a blister on his foot popped. His shoes weren't bad or too old or even too new, really, but he hadn't tied the right one tightly enough this morning. It had come untied during his furious race through the woods, and he'd never felt safe enough to stop to tie it. The one time he'd actually stopped, the thing that had eaten Harold had infested those three ladies and the swarms of flies surrounding them, and that had been enough to make him never want to stop running for the rest of his life. He jumped when something whizzed by his head. It felt like a wiffle ball, but was moving far too fast to be any kind of ball. A gross blob of something in a bright, unnatural blue color clung to a nearby tree, slowly slipping down the trunk like a putty wall crawler. More of the gross goo that had been pursuing him, but that had been black. And this, despite the poor light of the obscured moon, was clearly blue. He didn't get the chance to examine the blob very closely before another one flew by his head, green this time, then another and another, and adults were shouting and yelling at each other nearby. They sounded angry, but Taylor felt relieved. He'd found camp. Maybe the chaperones were just angry because he'd gone missing. At this point, he'd rather pay the piper for that and let the adults deal with the monster that had been pursuing him. 
They'd know what to do. Taylor ran toward the shouting voices, waving his arms wildly through the air. Help! Help! he yelled. Mr. Bailey? Mr. Tallfeather? Then, more tentatively and pinching his eyes shut, Mr. Carter? Taylor finally reached one of the adults, a tall man with a bloated belly like Mr. Carter's. He was hunched over, but he wasn't dressed in the Harley Davidson t-shirt Mr. Carter had been wearing earlier. The man looked up, but there was a mask covering his face, and he looked like a spaceman. Who the fuck brought their kid? The man's voice was slightly altered by the plastic mask. Ah, uh, sorry, Taylor said, holding out his hands as though pushing the man back. I must have gotten lost and... The man rose, and Taylor saw for the first time that he had been hunched over a headless woman. The masked man was clutching her head by a clump of curly hair the same steel gray color as Taylor's grandmother's. The bottom of her neck had been jaggedly severed, and in his other hand the man held the instrument of her decapitation, a serrated hunting knife. Slung over his shoulder was what looked like a toy gun, but having seen how he was behaving, Taylor was worried that it wasn't a toy at all. Nah, don't worry, kid. I'll take care of you. Why don't you stay a while? The man took a step and Taylor turned to run, but jumped back as he saw the overweight lady who had been taken over by the black goo, bouncing toward him at a speed far faster than any living person could move. It seemed she had come untethered from her two friends, which worried Taylor. Now the goo was not merely growing, but multiplying. The lady still bounced and bobbed like a marionette, and it was unsettling, but all the more so for having just cut off his escape route. He was between a rock and a hard place, Scylla and Charybdis, the monsters he'd read about in his starter book on Greek mythology. Jesus, Ken, the man said. You look rough. Or should I say, Karen? That's what you like to be called nowadays, isn't it, now that you think you're a lady? Want me to help you find out for sure? He grabbed his own crotch and yanked on it. Taylor looked away. People weren't supposed to behave that way. Petey did sometimes, but not adults, certainly. The lady stopped her weird, bounding gait and looked at the man. Taylor now had the name Karen to attach to her. And, unlike the man, he knew the importance of not dead naming a transgender person. His parents had taught him that it made people feel the same way he did when people called him retarded. It made him wonder what they were teaching adults these days. Karen smiled, a wide, unpleasant grin that didn't stop at the edges of her mouth, as the black goo within her body began to pour out. Her eyes opened, and tiny tentacles fluttered out from inside her lids as well. The man either didn't see what was happening in the poor light, or maybe he didn't understand. Harry Bowen, the woman said slowly, as though not using her own vocal cords, but having them tugged in particular ways by the goo to imitate sounds. You remember me, Harry said, having now totally forgotten about Taylor and turning toward Karen. I'm flattered. Let me give you a whole other reason to remember me. Karen held out her arms welcomingly, and Harry broke into a sprint toward her, clearly intending to do her some terrible harm with the knife. Don't no, wait, don't! Taylor squeaked, not even sure why he was bothering to warn the man, except maybe because of some basic level of human decency that his parents had instilled in him since birth. Harry turned and flung the severed head of the older lady in Taylor's direction. He jumped as it bounced like a skip stone toward him, coming to rest with a dull and lifeless expression on the poor lady's face. You little shit, you little cockblock! As Harry focused his attention on him, the black goo Karen thing lunged at him with whatever the exact polar opposite of grace was. Taylor watched, frozen to the spot as she wrapped her arms around Harry's shoulders and her legs around his hips. Thrown off balance, Harry started to fall backward, but tendrils sprouting from Karen's behind propped them both up. Let me go, 
Harry roared, flailing in anger. But though he was about Karen's size, the goo within her gave her unnatural strength, and he barely moved at all. Karen's head arced backward, and she seemed to sneeze for a moment, then began hacking like Taylor's cat sometimes did when it had a hairball. But instead of a little hunk of hair, she hacked up a massive tentacle of black goo. It slowly formed a curved shape like a backward question mark. Karen? Harry asked, his voice tentative. We had a good laugh, didn't we? I was just joshing you, you know? We used to have a little fun, you and I. No need to take it so personal. Karen's throat rippled as the goo she was continuing to yak up arced into Harry's open mouth. Eyes wide, he struggled like a drowning man, but to little avail. Karen held him fast. Taylor knew from unfortunate prior experience what would come next. The goo would take control of Harry, perhaps mutating into a different form yet again. He felt terrible for leaving, but he didn't know who this strange man was, and he sure couldn't help him. He had to find Mr. Bailey and the other adults. This time, he decided to be smart, slipping into the trees and walking with soft footfalls. He shuddered as he passed the older lady's head, trying to avoid looking at it but finding himself doing so anyway. He stared at her the whole time he passed, as though half expecting her dead eyes to look at him and her gaping mouth to start speaking. But she remained dead. Normal dead. That is, until he felt a fly zip by his head. He gasped, worried that it was going to bite him, but instead it made a beeline, fly line, for the head of the lady who reminded him of his grandmother. And it was just the first. A swarm of the flies, fat with alien jelly, descended upon her. Some flew like kamikazes into her mouth, nostrils, and ears. Taylor began walking backward mesmerized by the display, until his back hit a tree and he stopped. He watched with horror as the dead lady's jaw and face muscles began to contract. Then her eyes sank back into her head, replaced by twin teeming masses of the black goo. Tendrils of the stuff began to leak out of her severed throat and form distinct tentacles, trying to right her head and walk away like a land-walking octopus. Taylor patted the tree trunk a few times to make sure it was just a regular tree and not another horror beyond imagination. He'd never been able to watch a movie scarier than the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory before, though one time Petey had tried to make him watch that movie, The Human Centipede, citing his love for insects. But it hadn't been about insects at all and he had covered his eyes the whole time before finally just barreling his way out of Petey's basement. Petey. Oh, goodness. Why was he thinking about Petey? Then he realized why. In the distance, he could hear Petey's voice. Straining, he could hear Kendall's, Lamar's, and Steve's as well. A weird combination of relief and revulsion filled him. He finally understood deep down in his gut what his dad had once tried with some difficulty to explain to him about the expression, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. But it's still a devil, right, Dad? Taylor had repeated a few times, rather insistently. He had finally given up, seeing that his dad was growing frustrated trying to explain the concept to him, but he had never really gotten it. Until now, that is. He was relieved to hear someone he knew, but he absolutely didn't want to have to run to Petey and his crumbum friends for help. He picked his way through the dark forest toward his friends. As he came closer, he realized Petey was shouting something, and then the other three were shouting it back. It was a sort of a song game. I don't know what I've been told, Petey shouted. The others repeated it. Eskimo pussy is mighty cold, Petey continued. Taylor shuddered. They were so dirty. Always dirty. That man, Harry, had been dirty too. 
Sighing, he took a step forward and immediately felt his foot drop into a hole. Maybe a badger had made it, or maybe it had just come from the natural process of erosion like he'd learned about in Scouts. Whatever had caused it, his ankle had turned a bit and hurt like the dickens. As he tried to yank his leg loose, Petey and his friends came into view. Taylor instantly wished he had stayed back with the reanimated octopus heads, goo-possessed dead ladies, and space-suited molesters. The four boys were marching in lockstep. At the back of the line, Steve looked like he'd gotten his head caught in a blender. Slung over his shoulder, like a rifle, was a long bone, chunks of meat still clinging to it. If Taylor had to guess, and he desperately wished he had never been put into the position of guessing what sort of a bone Steve was toting over his shoulder, he would have thought it was a human leg bone. Next in line was Kendall, whose cheek was missing a chunk shaped like a slice of pizza. He was happily wearing a rib cage. Again, it seemed human, over his own shoulders like an armor chestplate. Ahead of him, Lamar, missing an eyeball, was keeping time by beating on the very top part of the skull as though it were a drum. The skull cap had definitely belonged to a human, unless the other boys had happened upon a great ape here in the woods of California, which Taylor was finding increasingly less impossible to believe after the day he'd had. But by far, the worst looking of the pack was Petey, who was leading the little entourage like Peter and all of his little companions facing down the wolf. He had a deranged look of joy on his face as he continued reciting his stomach-turning song. But more disturbing, perhaps, than his scarred, utterly deformed face was what he was wearing. Around his shoulders, he wore a cape. But it was no ordinary cape, like Taylor had sometimes played with when he was a bit younger. No Superman or Batman or Devil Slayer cape. The cape had been made from a human skin, which more or less confirmed the fears Taylor had about Lamar's drum, Kendall's chestplate, and Steve's rifle. The skin had been carved from its victim with more care than Taylor normally would have attributed to Petey who sometimes got bored waiting for ants to burn when using a magnifying lens on the sidewalk. But the still steaming skin had been cut from its victim, and the two arms tied together in a knot at Petey's throat. What was worse? Taylor was about 99% certain that some of these trophies had belonged to Mr. Carter. He hadn't particularly cared for Petey's grandfather, but nobody deserved a send-off like that. He extricated his leg as quietly as possible from the sinkhole and crouched. He tested putting his weight on his leg, and though it was sore, he was satisfied he hadn't broken or sprained it. He held his head in his hands, covering his ears, waiting for the other scouts to pass. Something terrible was going on in these woods. Something deep, dark, and foreboding. Something that was driving the people Taylor knew to madness and him to utter despair. Petey was a jerk, but Steve had always been pretty nice, if a bit easily led by the nose. Taylor knew all four boys, and he had to grudgingly admit that even Petey didn't have murder, actual real life and death murder in his heart. Perhaps the goo that had consumed Harold was affecting everything. Or perhaps they were both symptoms of the same disease. Taylor had no way of knowing. All he knew at this point was that he was doomed. It was probably his own screwed-up brain that made him not like other people, that kept him from acting the way they were. But it certainly wouldn't stop him from becoming their victim. He waited for the other four scouts to pass and then went in the opposite direction still favoring one leg as the pain in the ankle he'd heard slowly subsided to a dull throb. Let the nasty adults deal with the nasty children. He put his hands on a low-hanging branch and wrenched it nervously. To his surprise, he popped a bud, and a puff of some kind of pollen came out. It smelled strange, 
sweet and gross. Like a box of sweet and sour chicken his mom had once kept for a week in the fridge. He turned his eyes up to the great tree. Are you doing this? He asked. The tree, naturally, did not respond. Insects, Taylor knew. But trees were as much a mystery to him as most people. A tinkle of water caught his attention. No longer hurrying, Taylor slowly picked his way toward the sound. He wasn't sure if he could avoid a horrible fate in any case. At this point, he just wanted to avoid falling into another sinkhole. He soon found the little stream trickling through the woods. He stopped, realizing for the first time how tired and thirsty and exhausted he was. He cupped the water in his hands, but before he took a sip, he stopped. Retaining the cupped water in his right hand, he slowly reached in with his left hand and extracted a whirligig beetle. He kicked its legs in between his fingers. Taylor's head swirled. Sometimes he had trouble making sense of the world, but other times everything just clicked into place, like the last piece of a jigsaw puzzle turning it into a perfect picture. This was one of those times. Animals were noticeably scarce in the forest, he knew that. Bird song had been gone, insects had been all but non-existent. Then he had seen the black goo devour the flies. So that was where all the wildlife was going. It was being slowly and deliberately exterminated by that thing, whatever it was, that had also consumed Harold. The goo was somehow related to the trees, whose pollen stank of a weird sweet scent. Perhaps the goo was actually some kind of tree sap. He wasn't sure. But now, for the first time since he and Harold had found the toad, he held a living creature in his hand that hadn't been brought in by bus or van. The whirligig kicked again, eager to escape the pressure of his fingers, delicate though it may have been. He slowly lowered his hand back into the water and let the beetle go. It darted off, happy as a clam. And it wasn't the only one. The stream was alive with whirligigs. Taylor racked his brain. Whirligigs mostly skimmed across the surface of water. They were primarily interesting because of the bizarre little patterns they made when jetting across a waterway. But a whirligig in distress could go underwater. So could a toad. Was that the secret? Was the pollen stopped at the edge of the water? Taylor plunged into the stream to find out. In recent years, Devin had taken a shine to haunting old record stores looking for albums. For one thing, real vinyl had a warm, earthy quality that simply could not be reproduced on iTunes. For another, though a few modern artists were still releasing records as sales ploys, most vinyl came from a time where music had been rawer and more real. And the artwork. Record covers were real art, and deserving to be on the wall of a museum as any Manet, Monet, or Jacques. One cover he'd always enjoyed was Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. It depicted a man in a business suit, shaking the hand of another man, who was uncomplainingly on fire. Of course, the reason Devin was thinking about Wish You Were Here right now was, unfortunately, not related to any desire to hear Shine On You Crazy Diamond or the title track. It was because he was staring at a near-perfect recreation of that cover. Stieg Winthrop, at least Devin thought it was Stieg, an R&D puke, was quietly on fire. And though the flames were licking every part of his body and turning his clothes to a blackened mess, he didn't stop, drop, roll, or in any other way attempt to put himself out. He simply stood there, ratcheting up the pressure on his paintball gun far past safe levels and continuing to take pot shots at his fellow employees. Ow, my fucking eye! Someone screamed. Ooh, got one, Steak said. Probably the final words that would escape his lips before the last of the blackened ligaments holding his jaw to his head slipped and he became unable to speak anymore. Things might be getting a little out of hand, Devin said. Hey, mister, 
a high-pitched, sinister voice said. He turned around. Four kids in tiny toy soldier uniforms stood before him in a flying V. They actually looked pretty fucked up, like they'd been cutting each other's faces or something. Devin nodded. It wasn't like things had been straightforward up until now, but now shit was getting pretty surreal. Oh, okay, Devin said. Don't worry, I hate kids. I've always wanted to get into a fist fight with a bunch of them. Hang on a second, though. I just bought these boots and my dogs are barking. He reached down and unlaced his boots. He sighed in relief. Then he reached out and slapped one of the little kids in the head. Roaring almost as one, they leapt at him and started punching him in the balls and legs until he fell over, laughing. Oh, you kids, he cried out. He grabbed the nearest two heads and cracked them together. Two little grunts sounded. He wrapped his hand around the throat of another. Fuck this, said the fourth. The fat little kid who went off running. Fuck you, Steve, the kid under Devin's grip called out, turning purple in his jigsaw-like, falling-apart face. Devin stood up and threw the little kid as hard as he could. He wasn't really impressed with his toss, although he had never been great at bowling, so that wasn't exactly surprising. Luckily, they were on a bit of an incline, and the kid went tumbling away. Sighing, he went clomping off after the kid, planning to snap his neck or something. Unfortunately, the kid kept bouncing farther and farther away like a rock rolling down a cliffside. Except it wasn't a rock, it was a little boy scout or whatever. He turned back, resolved to kick in the heads of the other two, but they were already gone. They must have recovered and run off to attack some more of Devin's co-workers. This is getting out of hand, he called out. The head of Lynn the grandmotherly manager of the janitorial staff, who could hardly use a broom anymore with her arthritis but was a master of organization and made sure her people kept the Hirsch building spotless, crawled by. Just the head. It had been severed, and instead of a body or feet, it now seemed to have a set of black tentacles. This is definitely getting out of hand, Lynn. The Lynn octopus stopped and turned toward him. What was left of her eyes, which appeared to have been replaced with black tumors, narrowed. I know you, she said sloppily. Trash goes in the black can, recycling in the blue. What's so hard about that? Crouching, the tentacle mass beneath Lynn's head sprang, sending her jetting upward. Luckily, Devin noticed the move as it was happening and batted the head down with his paintball gun. He turned and focused on her, calling back all of his minimal experience of playing grade school soccer. I am the CFO of a major corporation. I do not have time to sort through my garbage like a common beggar. On the word beggar, his wind-up completed, and he struck Lynn full in the ear with the toe of his boot. Asshole, she cried out like a golfer yelling four as her head bounced off into the burgeoning night. He had no time to recover from that encounter, as a temp in a pleated skirt, yes, super good clothing for a camping trip, came leaping down off a tree limb, screaming at him like a baboon. He swung his paintball gun up, hoping to shoot her and at least distract her, if not catch her in the eye or something. Seriously, people had no one listened to his little speech about leaving their masks on? He didn't get a chance to pull the trigger, but as the temp came sailing down in a virtual freefall, her face did strike the muzzle of the paintball gun. The gun wrenched out of his grip to the left and the temp came down hard, also toppling him back on his butt. But thankfully, the woman didn't fall on top of him. Devin wiped his hands on his pants and pulled himself to his feet. Glancing over, he saw the woman had impaled herself on his paintball gun. It had passed entirely through her chest and was now sticking straight up, perpendicular to the ground, held aloft by the weight of her body. Other than that, though, the gun seemed to be in pretty good shape. Wiping the blood from it and pulling out a vertebra that had accidentally gotten lodged in the barrel, Devin yanked the weapon free of the temp's body. I'm afraid we won't be keeping you on after your time with us is up, sweetie, 
he said in the disgustingly saccharine tone he reserved for such discussions. Devin. Devin turned, his eyes rabbiting at the familiar voice. Standing before him, a vision in pink yoga pants and a tight tank top, was Amber. She looked different, somehow off. There was a herky-jerky quality to her movements, which threw him for a loop. The air seemed somewhat denser, as if perfumed by some unseen sensor, sickly and sweet, and the odor rose to meet his nose. Hello, Amber, he cooed. I've been looking for you all day. Torn free of her habitual ponytail, her long blonde locks waved in the air seemingly independent of the wind. They were streaked with strange black highlights that hadn't been there as recently as this morning when he had last slept with her. He realized, too, that her feet weren't touching the ground. Instead, she floated above it, her toes pointed toward the earth. The not wholly unpleasant but not wholly pleasant scent tickled the back of his nostrils once more. You're not really here, he said. You're a ghost or a vision or a delusion. Are you supposed to be the specter of my guilt? Is that what I'm supposed to believe? Because, honey, I don't feel any guilt about you or my wife or... God damn. Anything. He really didn't. For the first time in his life, he felt free of the constraints of society that made him pretend to care about things to fit in and get along. He laughed. A wicked, maniacal cackle. He wasn't stupid. His choices had been clear to him from an early age. Act on his impulses and live like an outcast, a hermit, or a serial killer. Or accept the bizarre rules of society, pretend to go along with them, and survive. The choice had seemed obvious, and he had thrived, prospered even. But now, out here in the woods, with every last vestige of civilization crumbling, he finally felt like himself. What was his marriage but a slip of paper and a stupid ring? He had seen Amber, wanted her body, and taken her. Everything else was semantics. The Amber Vision's hand reached out, and she beckoned him with a curl of her index finger. It was like something out of a cheap horror flick. Fuck this, he said. I don't see a dagger before me. Out of my way, I have people to kill. He barreled forward and expected to walk right through the Amber Spectre. It wasn't real after all, but no, it was. He shoved it out of his way. She fell to the forest floor. What the hell? You're really here? What's wrong with you then? Wiping a layer of cooling temp worker blood from the top of his paintball gun, he shoved it into Amber's mouth and pulled the trigger again and again. There was a reason he had warned everybody to keep their face mask on. And if Amber couldn't be bothered to follow the rules, he was damned if he was going to be either. She'd probably never speak again, which was just as good as far as he was concerned. He'd only considered her mouth to have one use, and it sure as shit wasn't gabbing about the weather. Amber's mouth opened, and a long, thick tongue lolled out, coated in a panoply of different paints from his weapon. The psychedelic appendage continued to unfurl until it was clear it was less a tongue and more a tentacle. Oh, okay, Devin said. So that's what's going on here. Totally reasonable. Here, let me help you with that. He snacked at the tentacle, missing it a few times before finally wrapping his hands around it. The paint made it slippery, so he grabbed it with his other hand as well. I'm going to rip this... What is this thing? Amber. He looked back and saw that similar tentacles were slipping from Amber's ears, nostrils, and other orifices. The various tentacles worked in tandem to raise her back up to a vertical position. He yanked on the tongue, trying to rip it in half, but the appendage was unusually wiry and strong. Devin jumped as he felt something feather past his asshole. Oh my, he said. Well, this is something a little bit new. You're not usually so adventurous, Amber. I could... 
He paused as the tentacle swirled around his taint and wrapped around the base of his ball sack. Lily, the new girl, no, Devin's new co-worker, his binary assessment of her gender irrelevant, from marketing walked by. Hey, Devin, she called out. Do you have a minute? This paintball game is kind of going off the rails. Not right now, Lily, Devin shouted back. I'm very interested in your opinions, and I want to validate them, but I'm busy just at this moment. Please make an appointment with my administrative assistant, okay? Lily heaved a loud, audible sigh and stormed off in a huff. Devin turned back to Amber. Just as the loops around his balls tightened and quickly sliced like a razor. Gah! Devin cried out in pain but tentacles of black goo wrapped around his head and dug deep into his mouth, choking off his cries. A tentacle flew up into his anus. Another dug itself deep into the new hole that had been made by his castration. Amber stared at him as his ears and nose filled with a seemingly endless stream of black goo. Gwen slowly sandwiched another double stuff Oreo between her teeth and cringed, chewing it with as much enjoyment as a mouthful of Brussels sprouts. She'd eaten almost an entire row of the cookies by herself, and for the first time in her life, she wasn't enjoying a sweet. She ate it because she was duty-bound to. No adult was forbidding it. But somehow the joy had been sucked out of cramming cookies down her throat. For right now... She pushed the package away and resolved to finish them later. Her father and Lydia were so absorbed in their research that they had completely forgotten about her. Lydia had edged her dad out of the computer seat and had been planted there ever since, her eyes locked on the screen like a zombie's. Her dad, who had always been a bit more old school anyway, had taken the opportunity to dig through the paper files. Look at this, he said holding up a fat stack of those old-fashioned printouts she'd only ever seen in movies with the whole-lined sides that you had to rip off. Here's a report on a kid named Liam. He and Lydia began gabbing about something or other. Gwen sighed and dragged her shoe across the concrete. They had been at this forever. Something suddenly caught Gwen's attention. She couldn't quite explain it. She wasn't exactly seeing it. It was almost as though she were feeling it like an emotion, but feeling wasn't the right word either. She just knew, vividly, what was going on outside the building. And it meant a friend of hers was in danger. She whirled around and rushed to her father, who was kneeling in front of a filing cabinet. Over and over, she shook his shoulder. He and Lydia both broke away from their work and looked at her. The alarm must have been showing on her face, but she hoped she didn't look crazy. What's the matter, sweetie? Did you hurt yourself? No, I'm fine, Dad, but Taylor's on his way here. We have to go meet him. He might need help. Lydia glanced around. Is there a security camera in here or something? Yeah, Seth replied. A whole row of them. Where did you see him, Gwen? Which monitor? He's not on the cameras. Then where did you see him? Lydia's tone was inquisitive, but matter-of-fact. Gwen paused, not wanting to say. But she had already revealed plenty today that the adults could use to send her to one of those scary mental hospitals if they really wanted. She pointed at the side of her head. In here. Jeremy felt like his head was about to explode. He had to sneeze, but knew he couldn't let it out. He didn't know what had turned his friends and co-workers into such murder-happy characters. But he knew he didn't want to draw them with the sneeze. He choked it back again and again, until his little gulping sounds finally caught Emilio's attention. Emilio looked panicked and shook his head. Don't, his boyfriend whispered. Jeremy swallowed the sneeze one final time a little cold saline liquid leaking from the sides of his eyes. I think I'm good. But he wasn't. The fit seized him, 
and he let out a thunderous sneeze that would have sent the birds fleeing from the trees had the forest not been so strangely devoid of wildlife. Cringing, he waited for the inevitable shouts of recognition and calls to come hunt them down. He opened his eyes a moment later, but there was only Emilio, warmly patting him on the back of his hand. We must be out of earshot, he whispered. Jeremy nodded. All he wanted to do was fall into Emilio's arms and let him carry him away to safety. But he knew Emilio wasn't the strong, burly alpha male type. He was more fussy and finicky, and at the end of the day, Jeremy always found himself falling back into old patterns of having to be the alpha one. A few minutes later, they were tromping through the forest again, side by side. The danger of being caught had kept them silent up until Jeremy's thunderous sneeze, but now that was no longer an excuse. Now they were just being silent because they had nothing to say. Well, Jeremy would be damned if he was going to give up on the best relationship he'd ever had without a fight. How far do you think it is to the road? He asked instead of anything meaningful. Emilio shook his head. I don't know. Jeremy didn't respond. The silence descended on them again like a shroud. And all he could think about was that this was the end. And they would go out, together, but not together, in that horrible, awful fugue state of being in a fight with their significant other and not having made up yet. He resolved to swallow his pride and just say, I love you. The words were almost on the tip of his tongue. I see a light, Emilio said. Jeremy paused and squinted. It was tough to make out, but in the overwhelming darkness of the strangely moonless and starless forest night, the one shining light that he could see was probably some distance away. It stood out, certainly. Must be the road, Jeremy said. A stopped truck or a streetlight or something. Oh, thank God, Amelia said, their previous worries about speaking openly now more or less forgotten. A friendly trucker will get us out of here, and he'll be able to call for help on one of those, what do you call those things, where they go breaker breaker one niner? Jeremy shook his head at Emilio's silly, sheltered upbringing. He'd actually driven a rig for a year or so before getting the job at the Hirsch Capital docks. Stuck out on a suspension bridge on his way to Rhode Island one night, the damn bridge had begun swaying, swaying and he swore off trucking ever again, or he might have been doing it still. The way Emilio had grown up, trucking would never have been considered a respectable position to his snooty father or his alcoholic blue-blood mother. A CB radio, he replied. And you know truckers aren't all necessarily friendly, right? We may have to give him something to get his help. What? With all of our friends murdering each other? What kind of a... Jeremy was smiling. Emilio's eyes narrowed. Oh, you mean a blowjob? I do mean a blowjob. Emilio rolled his eyes. Always so crass, mind half in the gutter. Crass or not, I call no blowing the trucker. Emilio shrugged. That's all right. You suck at it anyway. You take that back. Jeremy wrapped his calloused hand around Emilio's wrist. I said you suck. Get it? You suck? When it's about blowjobs, it means you don't suck. Emilio rolled his eyes again. So crass, he repeated, taking Jeremy's chin with both hands and kissing him. They continued toward the truck, and Jeremy finally had a smile on his face. In another hundred yards of picking their way in the dark through the pockmarked trail, nearly slipping into a sudden sinkhole at least once, it became clear that the light source was not a parked truck at all. In fact, they were nowhere near the highway. It's not a truck. It's a cabin, Jeremy said. I can see that. And is that... Is that your friend Tasha from marketing? Emilio nodded. Tasha was inside the cabin, and though she seemed calm... Maybe even happy, she was acting strangely. She 
she appeared to be having a tea party, like you would with a child. She went through the motions of taking an imaginary sip from a teacup and placing it back on the saucer, and placing one sugar lump or two into her cup before sipping again. Emilio stalked toward the window. Jeremy's boyfriend had never been hunting or been much of an outdoorsy type in general, so watching his attempts at stealth would have been laugh-out-loud hilarious under almost any other circumstances. He seemed to have a knack for finding every snapping twig and crunching leaf as he went, but so far Tasha hadn't glanced out the window in their direction. Jeremy followed with some modicum of actual stealth. When they were nearly fogging the glass with their breath, Jeremy finally caught a glimpse of the other inhabitant of the cabin. It was a young black girl, maybe ten or eleven, and she seemed to be hanging on Tasha's every word. It was far too weird to believe that one of their Hirsch Capital co-workers had a relative out in this podunk backwoods. But while that would have been odd, it was downright impossible to believe that someone could have had a relative out here and never mentioned it. At a minimum, it would have been an excuse to avoid Devin's mandatory fun exercise come massacre. So what did that make this little girl to Tasha? A stranger? And if so, how they become so chummy? It made Jeremy's skin crawl in an eerie way, completely different from the heart-pounding terror of his recent brushes with death. Further compounding his unease was the misshapen hulk in the corner. A massive stuffed teddy bear, but covered in dirt and forest detritus and... Blood? No, it couldn't be blood. Whatever it was. The thing gave him the creeps. Still, he'd take almost anything over the carnage out there. He tugged on Emilio's sleeve and instantly regretted it, as it made him feel like a little kid begging for his daddy's permission. Let's knock on the door and see what's going on. Emilio rubbed his chin. I don't know. Something's weird here. Weird, sure. But deadly? No. Jeremy said. Tasha and that girl don't seem to be acting like all those crazies back there. Maybe we're outside of the field or whatever of the effect. At least we'd be in out of the dark. It's a place to hole up. Or a place to get trapped. My gut is screaming at me to wait. Your gut? Your gut is going to be spread all over this forest floor if we stay here a hell of a lot longer. Wait a minute. Did you see that? Emilio asked. Jeremy looked back into the cabin. The tea party was continuing unabated. I don't see anything but some kid and a friend of yours talking. Did you notice that gigantic, weird-looking teddy bear in the corner? Where did it go? You're listening to Silverwood by Stephen Kozanewski. Starring Neil Helligers and Sarah Malo Christensen. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. Silverwood is written by Brian Keane, Richard Chismar, Stephen Kozanewski, Michelle Garza, and Melissa Laysan. Based on Silverwood by Tony E. Valenzuela. It is produced by Lydia Shama and executive produced by Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, and editing by Amanda Rose Smith. Theme music by Brandon Roberts.